how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I am so thankful more than ever for this space, this air conditioned space in here in the barn that used to be just like a rough. This is kind of just like a dumping ground for It was for stuff, junk. Right? We just had stuff in here and it was unfinished and uncooled. Today is 109 degrees outside. Um, so we're pretty much just on water mode, like making sure things aren't wilted. And I swear the drip irrigation, if it is going to malfunction, it will malfunction when it's over 100 degrees. We've had so many pots, so many things like malfunction this week. So we're making multiple like trips through the garden throughout the day to make sure nothing is wilting. So we have two more days of 109 and then 110 degree day. And I'm sure hoping that as we get closer to that day, it kind of drops a little bit. It typically does. Yeah. Usually it gets a little bit more mild as we get closer. And then we're going back down into the 90s, which I never thought I would welcome 90s, 90 temperatures, 95, 96, right. but I welcome them now. And I know a lot of you guys are kind of doing the same thing and even hotter than us. Mm -hmm. So anyway, huh, we'll make it, we'll make it through. Uh, let's just jump into the videos from last week. First one was planting oak leaf hydrangeas, snowball bushes, and a crab apple tree. So I planted five of the Gatsby pink oak leaf hydrangeas around the base of the blue spruce that we had installed this spring. And then a Sergeant crab apple out in the South Garden and three Eastern snowball bushes out in the South Garden. Uh, and I was really excited really to focus on some kind of like, well, like even the tree grows about the same size as the snowball bushes. So it's kind of like large shrub, small tree statured things. And the oak leaves grow upwards of eight by eight, I think five to eight feet by five to eight feet or six to eight feet, I don't know. Anyway, larger things. Loray said, Laura, you're giving your secret away. You split yourself into clone Laura's and that's how you get so much done in your vast gardens. Things are really looking great in every direction. Uh, yeah, I wish that, I, <laughs> would you be able to handle that, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> I wish that some, some moments I could split myself into more people and I mean, many hands, right? <laughs> yeah. Adrian said, does the Gatsby pink hydrangea come in a miniature shrub? You know, there's Gatsby gal, it's a little bit smaller, like maybe five by five. I know my parents planted an oak leaf hydrangea once called Munchkin. And that one stayed like maybe three and a half to four feet tall and wide. I think that's the smallest one that I'm aware of. There's probably other ones. You could just pro probably Google oak leaf hydrangeas and like start sifting through a bunch of different varieties. Munchkins have performed really well in my parents' garden though. Uh, Romy said, what about a dogwood? I'd love to see one in your yard. You know, I had a Venus dogwood behind our fireplace area that was not doing well. Um, we dug it up and it, the reason why it wasn't doing well, it's like it didn't have a root system. It was like this little disc of roots for this massive tree. Well, I mean, it was freshly planted, so it wasn't like an established big mature tree, but it was a big tree versus its root system. We planted it out in the South Garden because it, I just thought maybe a change of location because it was doing so poorly where it was at and it did not end up surviving. We do have a June snow dogwood planted um, kind of by the big mulberry tree. Most of the time here, they're kind of understory trees. Like we need to provide them a little bit of protection in order for them to be happy. And we just don't have that uh, maturity yet in our other trees. So I think those types of plants will happen a little bit later once we've got some of our like big- 10 years down yeah, the road. Some of our big shade trees um, have some size. Carly said, I know you use biotone, which contains some mycorrhizal fungi, but have you tried using just straight mycorrhizal fungi on its own for planting trees and large shrubs? I've had really good luck with it. Before planting, I soak the root balls so the mycorrhizal fungi sticks and make sure to give it a generous coating, both in the hole and around the sides of the root ball so it's completely covered. I find it really gives a tree a fighting chance after severe root pruning. Just an idea if you're looking to plant more enormous trees. Maybe that would have helped the Venus dogwood. I actually haven't tried straight, straight mycorrhizal fungi. Um, it would be an interesting experiment to run, I think. We've had really good luck with the biotone, though. You know, um, there was that one company, um, I think it was kind Back of like Back to the a, Roots? Was that what it was? Does that sound right? It was like hmm. 2016. Didn't they send a little tub? Yeah. What is that called? Mycorrhizae. And it, you know, it, that kind of thing is so difficult to gauge if it's working or not because you have to plant that versus something next to it you know yeah that you didn't use the mycorrhizae on oh back to the roots is like a you can grow mushrooms in a box oh that's back to us kind of fungi i don't know i don't remember what that company was called it was a long time ago or if they're still around i have no idea yeah 
Tina said, is this your forever home? I get the sense the proximity of your neighbors is bothersome to you. I don't blame you if it did. I'm sure it feels like you're in a fishbowl at times since they probably know who you are. Yeah, we know all of our neighbors and we like all of our neighbors. They're all really good. Like I couldn't have handpicked better ones to you know, be right next to us. And we knew when we bought this house that that whole subdivision was going in. In fact, our, our uh, field that we is now the South Garden that we bought is zoned like it's urban growth development. Mm -hmm. Like they want to put a subdivision there. And that's one of the reasons why we bought it to kind of, you know, stop a subdivision, stop a subdivision from going in and kind of reclaim that spot and make it gardens and trees and all of that kind of thing. Um, as well as the other pasture we just bought that yeah. was also zoned for the same thing. So eventually like down the road, you know, if somebody bought our house, they mm -hmm. could potentially sell those other two pieces and have more, well, one thing, one thing that's always kind of bothered me a little bit is that there is a, a um, I don't know what you call it, but like a future road. The master plan of our city. The master shows... plan of our city shows a, a main road going through our property, mm -hmm. like like right in front of our front door. Um, we would probably have like from the front door, maybe like thirty or forty feet. Yeah. But not a lot, you know. No, right. And and it would be. It'd be like a major, not a major road, but like um, they said every four blocks or so, they want kind of like a like wider a connecting yeah, like street. A, I forget what there's a name for it. Mm -hmm. But um, so that always kind of bothers me that that's on the plan. And I've talked to people at the city and they say, you know, you guys are an asset to the community and, you know, we're not going to just put a road through your property for no reason. But, you know, if there ever was a good reason to put in a road, they'd be well within their rights to do it. Yeah. And we'd have to pay for it, too, because that's the way it, it works in our area, is that you have to pay for half the road. And since we own on both sides, we have to pay for the entire road to go through. Um, you get your paved road, Aaron. Oh, geez. Yeah, I would get a <laughs> paved road, but it would go, it would just go smack dab through our property. Yeah, it is likely uh, that it would never happen in our lifetime or ever. I mean, when we think about what it would connect there's really, it would have to plow through several other homes to connect the way they'd need to connect. I don't think it'd have to go through homes. I think it'd have to go through a couple shops, but those can, oh. you know, those can, shops can come down fair, you know, like. But then you'd have like a road right up on your house, like right yeah. up on your house. Yeah, but that happens, you know, Dang, that happens as can't. cities expand. Yeah. Sometimes there just is no front yard to, yeah. to houses because they're built too close. I think though, because I feel like that's such a low likelihood, our biggest motivator for ever leaving would be schools for the kids mm -hmm. um, because we don't have very good options right in our immediate area um, and i think we would have a lot more options if we moved to the boise eagle mm -hmm. kind of area over there and most of our family except for our parents so it's yeah. our parents and aaron and i and our kids so both your still, uh, siblings both my siblings are in the and three of mine area. have already moved yeah to, to idaho it's only a 45 minute 45 minutes to an hour Mm -hmm. drive and we make it all the time we went yesterday yeah you know so it's really not that far it feels like home even though it's an hour down the but road we've established ourselves so much here i can't imagine ever moving but you would love he would love the opportunity i think to build a home someday yeah i think you know because when we bought this place we were taking over someone else's design mm -hmm. and so you're not starting from scratch you're starting from you know whatever what, it happened whatever previously. was on their mm -hmm. mind which yeah. is you know everybody's different mm -hmm. and some things don't seem to make sense to me like oh why'd you do it that way and I would have done it this way or whatever Well, you're dealing with I mean we're lucky we only had three people different people living in our home up till us but yeah. can you imagine like if you have lots of different people moving in and out of the home how many other different things may have happened right. because I think it was the second owners not our friends that owned it before but it was the second owners that put on the addition and did like some weird stuff yeah. <laughs> like some really weird cut some corners and and stuff and Dennis and Mary did a tremendous amount of work to bring it to where it is yeah. now, pretty much because we've not done a lot to the house. Um, and they were still, you know, had lots of plans of working on it, but I mean, you guys know how it goes. Yeah. I don't know, I feel like we could talk about this one question all day long. So in a way, to answer the question, you know, is it your forever home? It feels like it now, but I think we're both realistic. And our number one thing is our kids. So mm -hmm. if at any point we felt like we could give our kids a better life or a better education mm -hmm. somewhere else, I think that we could pick up and move oh, in a second easy. because that would just that to, to us that trumps everything else right well and to you know we've talked about several times the reason why we have bought like the south garden and then we bought the pasture this spring 
uh, is because it's for our business. Like per, on a personal level, you and I wouldn't be doing this amount of space. We couldn't. We wouldn't. We wouldn't be able Unless to afford it. Unless we were independently wealthy. And, yeah. Well, that, yeah. There's that. But <laughs> we then the you could hire people, and you know. But because it's our business, that's why. I mean, we've dumped so much of what we have made just right back into the business that um, that's what we've kind of. That's what I don't know. What, that's what has brought us to this point and the sure. property to where it is at this point. Um, otherwise, if it was on a more personal level, like we had a hard time just keeping up with what it was before we owned any extra yeah. land, you know, yeah. just the two of us anyway, right. while you're trying to work. And I can't imagine the work with the kids on top of that and then trying to manage that more by ourselves. It just wouldn't happen. Jules said, which type of snowball viburnum? It's an Eastern snowball viburnum. What's a botanical? Straight up Eastern snowball viburnum, which is viburnum opulus, sterile. There you go. Paula said, one of my biggest changes since finding Garden Answer is now planting in my yard beyond June. Thinking of the blossoming perennials you have planted recently, I wonder, do you ever cut back your blooms to allow the plant to focus on root growth? Or is heavy watering and or fertilizer the secret to leaving the blooms on the plants? Well, consistent water for sure is important. Um, starter fertilizer is something we always use. I just talked about it on a video that may go up before this one does. It may be slightly after, I'm not sure how that's gonna pan out, but uh, on some, Perennials, those that I can tell are struggling a little bit, like some of the echinacea. I planted some of the new raspberry beret along the west side. They were so poorly rooted when I planted them that I've been deadheading those. Um, typically, I leave even the spent blooms on echinaceas uh, so that they can form seed and um, stay through the fall and winter. But I've been deadheading them pretty soon after the flower fades so that the plant just has more energy to send back into root growth and that sort of thing. So sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I think it just depends on how the plant's reacting. And we typically don't have this intense of heat. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were a few years ago when we had like the really bad fire year and it was just smoky all. Mm -hmm. It was the first year of the cut flower garden, I think. Um, 110 feels rare to me. Like it gets over 100. But I don't remember that many times where it's it's like 110. I just, I remember that one summer was like 104, 105. Mm -hmm. I think I, we saw some 106 maybe. And it was like orange and smoky mm -hmm. and kind of just like, blah. Like, why do we live here kind of yeah. blah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Olive said, I always thought hydrangeas needed shade. Ours tend to scorch, ours tend to scorch if they get four to five hours of sun a day. Are these sun loving varieties? Um, so the oak leaves in our area, I feel like they benefit from some protection. Also, um, macrophyllas and serratas, I hardly ever plant those anyway because they just don't thrive in our area. The arborescens, I think, could use some protection too. Mm -hmm. We have incredibles that get a little bit too much sun and they wilt hard every day and then they kind of, we have to give them a lot of extra water and they pick back up. If you want a hydrangea that can handle sun, do a paniculata. Like hands down the mm -hmm. best. You still need to provide them in a harsh climate, quite a bit of extra water, um, as opposed to everything that's probably planted around them. Um, they'll need probably double of whatever everything else is getting, um, but they can handle the sun. They don't tend to scorch and they bloom beautifully. We have um, that one on a standard by the vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. And the vegetable garden obviously is like just all day sun. There's mm -hmm. nothing that shades it, except for in the very end of the day, there's the like eight, 10 foot tall arbs. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, they'll shade it though. No, they really don't. I think it's... It's like as the sun is almost down, maybe. Yeah. So it's you know. all day sun and that limelight does great. The, yesterday, we had to give it for the very first time a little bit of supplemental water. Mm -hmm. And I actually think the drip is not functioning on this uh, north side. Mm. Because all the perennials and that hydrangea standard were all wilted last night. Mm. So we've got to do some trial and error. I yeah. just, I don't know what it is. It's like this week our drip is just... Maybe it's not been functioning great this whole time, but just the intensity of the heat yeah. just brings out the issues. So anyway, we just deal with one thing at a time around here. Next video was Seed Hall trying some new varieties. So I got to sit on my parents' deck, which is a rare treat during the middle of the day. It was a nice day too. There was like a slight breeze and in the shade because we don't have the high humidity. It was pretty darn nice. I even had a cup of coffee out there with me, which in the middle of summer is kind of unheard of right in the middle of the day. Um, but I was there to be with my mom uh, over the last few weeks after she broke her leg and ankle. Uh, we just make sure that there's somebody with her to help her move around or get her things, keep her ice water filled, you know, that sort of thing. Um, she is doing better. She had her surgery. She went in her for her one week check yesterday and everything looks like it's 
standing firm, staying firm at first before she had the surgery and like she had to get plates and all that kind of stuff and rods, a rod, whatever in her leg. Um, before that, when they were waiting for the swelling to go down, they had like uh, not, it was like a soft cast or something or a, I don't know, but her whole like foot and ankle were twisting Ugh. like opposite. It was really weird. She had to go in and get it reset and all of that. but. She's on the mend. She has six weeks of non-weight bearing. I think that's pretty standard, right? Mm -hmm. After a surgery like that. And they say that it will probably take a full year to recover completely, to feel like it's back to old, her old self, which is such a bummer. It's a bummer, but you know, she's handling it really well. She called me just a little while ago, said I'm placing a plant order. Yeah. You know, do you want to look at the availability? So she's still going for it, even sitting there, you know. Anyway, I was there so that I could be with my mom that afternoon and I thought it was a perfect opportunity to bring out a box of seeds I just got and it's always fun to talk about seeds. So I went through eight of the varieties of like seven, I had like 72 in there, I think. So eight, no, 76. I just wanted to focus on eight of those varieties though because they were either uh, new varieties to me or ones I had tried but had very limited experience with. So Dana said, I just wanted to say thank you for consistently posting informative, uplifting videos, which I enjoy with my tea before work. I used to watch the news, which left me feeling anxious. Oh, I, the same. Now I've been watching Garden Answer for a few years and it, I feel it's really made a difference in my life. Kudos to the two of you. Please give my best to your mom. She's in my thoughts and prayers. That's awesome, Dana. Thank you for that comment. Christine said, how long are seeds good for? One year? Seeds are good for a long, 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 long time. Depends on how they're stored. You just want to put them somewhere cool, like packaged well, not somewhere where they're going to get damp. I have mine just, uh, I don't have them near, but I can see them. Um, they're just in like boxes or tubs and they're here in the studio. It's nice and cool in here. I just make sure they aren't exposed to moisture, that sort of thing. Isn't there that vault in Greenland or Iceland or something that has bunch of seeds like, like a seed bank yeah. yeah and they just keep it cool and uh -huh. those supposedly will last for like forever yeah i don't know i don't know do they like rotate seeds out though I don't, yeah, after I don't a certain know. amount of year we should research well i think that. if you freeze them or if they're cool enough yeah i don't know if you necessarily need to freeze them like i don't think people need to be storing their seeds in the freezer necessarily i don't know but i don't know it's, maybe maybe it's better yeah <laughs> um i do know that there are certain seeds that lose their germination rate faster than others um like corn and tomatoes and onions um peppers I, but even then it's just a few percentage a year so like if you have really old seed like for example i planted some squash seed that i ordered when we lived in our townhouse so it's at least like eight years ago or something like that. I still have packets from eight, 10 years ago. And I just plant like double of what I normally would with fresh seeds. So if I planted three seeds or five seeds in a hill, I'd just like toss eight, nine, 10 in the hill. And that way, you know, if some of them aren't viable anymore, at least you still have some come up. Amy said, can you direct yarrow or lavender in the fall or direct seed yarrow or lavender in the fall in the ground? You could sure give it a try. I've would never it done it before. You think? Probably. I've done, I've direct seeded echinacea in our very first garden, hmm. very first one. And it came up beautifully. Nice. Like how random to try that. Yeah. I had hardly any experience on my own, you know, yeah. I was just used to doing the chore list at home. Yeah. Well, you had access to seeds because your parents, so yeah, it's so like, what, try what are you it. out really? Yeah. As Jay said, would putting your lysianthus on a heat mat speed its growth? I don't know. I mean, maybe I wonder though. It's just been a minute since I've read the back of one of those packets. So I'm going to look at the growth information here because I typically have not done that because it dries stuff out so fast. So days of germination, you do 10 to 15 days, 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And then once they are up after emergence, reduce the temperature to 60 to 70 degrees. So they don't mm. want to grow on super warm. So, um, Avoid stressing the plants with high temperatures over 85. Huh. My plants are probably so stressed out there right now. <laughs> Maybe it's the seedlings. Imagine how much trial and error you have to go through to like get to that information yeah. of knowing at what temperature ranges things like to grow. Right. You have to have so many years of trying it. Yeah. You know, because you can change the temperature at a certain point one year mm -hmm. and then try something. I don't know. It just well, seems like, like so much. Well, like the people, I, I talked about the companionas and how they just, they had figured out in their zone five unheated greenhouse, if they started those companionas seeds early on in the fall, then they had blooms by June, but also it, it like uh, stimulated better basal growth and better branching hmm. and longer stems. Hmm. So like 
Yeah. Yeah, who knew? Yeah. Tia said, wonderful to hear mom as well. Question, what do you think about mulching with topsoil when there's no compost available? I don't know if I would do topsoil. There's like, what's in it? Does yeah. it look nice? Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why we use compost is because it is adding good things into our soil. Like all of that's gonna work its way down. But the compost we get also looks pretty. Mm -hmm. Like it also maintains a fairly dark color without being dyed. Um, and so that's kind of the main purpose of, well, not the main purpose. It could maybe be your main purpose of mulching is for things to look pretty. I like that too. I like things to look tidy. I like our drip irrigation to not show. Um, but mulching also helps weed suppression and it helps, you know, reduce water loss and things like that. Um, but I don't know. I probably wouldn't use topsoil, but maybe you have a source for some really good stuff. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I probably would. I mean, you could plant in topsoil, but to me, it's just not mulched. Right. So if you like spread topsoil and then you plant in that, that's great. But you wouldn't you want to, to add more because it's just like adding more dirt, essentially. Mm -hmm. Extra I, step, not worth it. No, I, I wouldn't. Because the weeds would still grow in yeah, that. I wouldn't but it's it. not adding anything particularly good back into the right. soil. Yeah. I think that's why we've found so much good luck with like the land and sea because mm -hmm. it has all this stuff um, like it's more acidic based compost mm -hmm. and it's got a bunch of stuff that our soil doesn't have mm -hmm. so like just going locally and getting a bunch of topsoil it's like well it's just more of what you already have but mm -hmm. when you're putting a bunch of you know i don't know it has like kelp and crab yeah. you know stuff in there mm -hmm. yeah adding things that your soil doesn't have yeah nicholas said those dianthus look like carnations am i missing something nope they're same thing same same Different names, same plant. Uh, there's lots of different dianthus out there. So there's dianthus that look like these, and then there's dianthus that have the grassy leaves, but then like the little single blooms that pop up just above the leaf canopy. Those are ones I don't really like to put in my garden very much because I never know the best time to shear them back. Like they'll come out and bloom gorgeous first thing in the spring or like early summer. And then they, they continually start to form buds though. So mm -hmm. like even when you go into shear and back, you're seeing all of these buds that you're about ready to cut back. And you think, am I doing this right? Should I just be deadheading all of these plants? Which would take forever. So maybe just going in and like just shearing all of that back and letting them flush back is the way to go. Yeah, the problem is that it looks bad, but not quite bad enough to where you feel like you should be shearing it yet. Yeah. It's like, oh, should I wait? Yeah. I don't know. It's always just a little bit of a mess for Probably me. just shouldn't wait. We should just test it where you plant it. Yeah. And then you just, no matter what, after your full bloom is, mm -hmm. you know, done, just then share just it anyway. share back. Just don't look. Yeah, don't look it. at it. <laughs> Digs and Dirt said, this is my second year starting yarrow from seed and the plants are nice and healthy but have never bloomed. I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong or not doing right. Has anyone else had this issue? Not had them bloom. I mean, so long as they're getting enough sun, they don't really need a lot of fertilizer or anything Is it like a, that. Like a biennial thing? No, oh. they're a perennial. Huh. Let me see if there's anything. I never really heard of that happening, but we shall see since I'm going to be starting Garo from the first time from seed. Um, Maybe it's one of the situations. What was that movie where they planted a bunch of different things and it was corn, corn? Oh, yeah. It's like not That's yarrow at all. <laughs> secondhand lions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe, you know, some plants are, I get what you're saying by biennial. That, um, like it doesn't that, bloom every other year or something Well, like biennials that. are a plant that don't live for more than two years. Oh. It's like a, a plant will, um, like the first year on a foxglove, some of them won't bloom. And then the second year they'll bloom, scatter their seeds, the mother plant will die, and then mm. they'll come back up fresh from the seeds. That's what a biennial is. Uh, but it might be a situation, I'm not seeing anything about it though here. Um, where they just don't bloom the first year. Maybe you need to wait till the second, but I don't think so. I think there should bloom the first year. So I don't know, maybe just a lot of sun and... Maybe you need to coax them with little candies. Little... <laughs> Is that your answer to everything? Yeah. <laughs> Janine said, I just learned what QIS stands for. I have, I've seen that on so many different seed packets and finally looked it up. Quality and seed. Who knew? Who knew? So it's an acronym, not a... I always try to pronounce it. Quis... Oh, really? Yes. But I knew it was quality in seed. Oh. Like, I've been told that so many times because every time I see it on a seed packet, I do the same thing. Huh. And then I always have people in the comment section tell me it's quality in seed. For some reason, I do not retain that piece of information. Yeah. Maybe I will now, now that I've Do you ever do that it. with uh, spelling words? Like, you've learned how to spell. Of course, you don't have an issue with spelling. I do. Well, there's some words, though. Um, peak. It's yeah, right. Peak you, and peak. The peak of the mountain oh. versus peaking around a corner. Yes. They're spelled different. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, you do. You ask me I on that one. I see that a lot. That's, 
I have, I feel like a lot of words that I have learned how to spell it over and over and mm -hmm. over. And then every time I come across it after it's been a month or two, uh -huh. I'm like, boom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perennial actually used to be one for me. I'm like, is it two R's, R's mm. or two N's? And I used to make signs at the garden center. I think I did it wrong once and somebody called me out on oh. it. <laughs> I should know better. Next video is the chicken coop flower bed needed some attention. Oh, that was a little bit embarrassing. And I really wish I would have had an overcast day to do that project. The whole thing looks pretty bad the whole time. I mean, it looks, it looks pretty rough when you've got white powder dirt next to anything. I cannot wait to get that done. I'm getting closer and closer to maybe being slightly frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean okay so the latest you guys is that the water was not run properly into the Hartley <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't run so it's fine inside the Hartley but we had frost free water run right behind it to the frost free the new frost free by our weeping willow and they kind of went off of that into the Hartley but they brought it up outside and then went in so they brought in the the line up like to where a normal normal hose faucet would be which could possibly freeze in the winter time. Which could mean if I use that hose, like we'd have to turn off all the water because it's connected to the frost freeze. Yeah, you can't even isolate that one. You can't even one. use, yeah. So it was completely put in improperly. We have to have the back of the Hartley area dug out again and have that one line. Just, they don't have to dig up the floor, maybe like a little bit of the floor that comes out. Maybe like six inches in. Yeah, they just have to dig deep enough and connect the line down at the proper depth and then inside the Hartley, they can bring it up to where the rest of the line runs. It's so close that it, it almost feels like it you, may not. May, maybe you don't need to break up the floor, but mm -hmm. if you can if you can dig far enough in, like down and then underneath the floor, because you have to go four feet down. Mm -hmm. So if you can dig, f I don't, it's possible we don't, won't need to break up the floor, but we might need to break up the floor. I think the thing for me that I, at this point, I'm just like, does, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to complain or, or act, I don't know. I just feel like, I don't know, that's not my job. Yeah, like, I'm when not you ask someone to do something, I, yeah, it's I'm like, these are the parameters. I'm you to do this, and I'm just guessing that you're going to do it right. Yeah. When everything's exposed and open and there's trenches everywhere, and then when you find out it wasn't, it kind of makes you feel like Taking advantage a little gutted of. a little bit. Yes. So, I mean, it won't be, it'll be a big hole for a minute. They'll fix it. I mean, it'll be a day's, maybe not even a full day's project. Um, but it just sets you back that much further and I want to plant. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all of that said, I'm surprised you've I didn't get sweaty. Plant. You've wanted to plant since the beginning. I know. Well, I ordered boxwoods like in April. We've had yeah. these boxwoods sitting there forever. We, I think we probably, uh, we might plant this fall, but I really think it's going to be next year that we'll plant. The boxwoods? I don't, until all the hardscape is done, we can't plant. Back to the flower bed behind the chicken coop. <laughs> I let that one go for a long time because I thought we would be after that area so much sooner than we are going to get to it. Um, so I just kind of left it there knowing I was going to dig things out, redo the pallet walkway. And there's a lot of other things that, you know, we can focus our attention on, but it just got to a point where I thought, I need to, I need to handle this area because it's just like out of control and it looks bad. It looks, you know, um, and in person, it looks so much better. It just, I was watching the video back I'm like, Aaron, I don't even know if the after is worth <laughs> looking at. I mean, it was tidied up, but I thought it was a good video. I actually, you yeah, said you that. liked it. Yeah. You were like, Oh, I'm so disappointed with this. And then I watched it and I thought it was great. <laughs> Either way, we got the plants handled. I got the things treated uh, for chlorosis that needed it. Um, it just was a good once over, I think. Uh, Penny said, love the toad hopping through. So nice to know that there's hope for my overgrown bed. Inspires me to tackle my craziness. Well, I'm glad to know that other people have craziness <laughs> like us. And that toad, we've actually been noticing toads around our garden this yeah, year. Yeah, several. Which is so exciting. There's actually one, like a big one, that lives in the little coleus area that I plant by our back kitchen entrance every year. And it lives right at the base of one of the emitter holes. Yeah. And it's got like a little burrow, like a little where it's kind of made itself it's a little water hole. water every day. Yeah, and Benjamin goes and checks on it. And uh, anyway, it was out on the sidewalk last night. Kind of fun. Uh, Linda said, uh, that looks pretty good. You work so hard. One question, why is it when I'm done working in the garden, I look like something the cat dragged in and you still look beautiful? Well, I have the, <laughs> I have the, um, option to go in and cool off and like wipe my face off before I put the camera back on my face. If I turn the camera right back on my face right after I got done with something like that, I have like debris 
all over myself. I actually carry, I have a little like compact mirror and I have a washcloth. <laughs> I'll open up the, you know, I'll look at myself and just like wipe sometimes. Sometimes I forget and I'm like, Aaron, yeah. can you edit out that big smudge like across my face? Or, you know, I do one of like these and I've got dirt on my nose or wherever, you know, it just happens. Also, it's not humid here. Yeah. That's super helpful. Do you remember there was somebody who commented at one point? I, I found it so hilarious that um, they said something like, well, she obviously has like a makeup crew or something. It was something along those lines. Where? Like, yeah, really? <laughs> Yes, for sure. My crew is just standing off. Yeah, the, just waiting for uh -huh. you. Yeah, that would sure be nice. I Most of the time, like that video, I was the entire crew. I was the camera crew. I was yeah, the garden everything. crew. Yeah. LS said, I remember when you built that walkway. What year was that? Such a great project. Boy, that was like, it was a year before, uh, it was like 2018. Yeah, 17 or 18. It was before Benjamin was born. Mm-hmm. You know, that was in the time where we were 2017. still, yeah, we were still gathering tools. I remember because we went and bought a reciprocating saw, mm -hmm. I think, or a circular saw, but you know, we, we pretty much have like all the power tools that we, it's, it's rare that we need to go buy a new power mm -hmm. tool now. Like I feel like in this property, cause we moved from like the, the town lot, you know, yeah. where you just don't really do a lot of DIY right. projects cause you don't have space to store tools mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But here all of a sudden you're doing a lot of stuff and. But anyway, that's what I remember about that project is that we needed to go buy some power tools to, mm -hmm. to get the project done. So it was, it must've been early on. And Monica came and helped me tear apart some pallets in the very, I needed to finish just a little bit more. Yeah. So she came and we were still using before we figured out you could just get the reciprocating saw with the metal blade and just yeah. cut all the boards off, just cut the nails. You were just taking all the nails out. We were just out. using a pry, a pry bar yeah. and hammers. Well, you showed it in the video, I think. Oh man. Do you remember moving into this house with two small cars? Uh -huh. and no pickups mm -hmm. we didn't have as much stuff though no we didn't yeah but thinking back on that like what what do you do if you need to go buy a board at home depot and bring it home well i'll tell you exactly what you do you open up the hatch in the back seat <laughs> and you run it from the um the hood you know the underneath the window dashboard yeah it runs from the dashboard all the way through the middle console through that back hole and out your trunk I did it several times. And then you just like sideswipe a bunch of people? No, it's just, it's, oh, it's, it goes out the, the back. Yeah, sure. You put a little red ribbon on the back yeah, of it. There you go. <laughs> it works pretty well. I saw a thing online where a guy was in the trunk of a car and they had two trees sticking up and he was in, laying in the back holding onto the trees and they were so that oh, they yeah. wouldn't fall down. Do you remember we bought um, our first flat screen TV that was like 32 inches or 37 inches? It wouldn't fit in our car. It wouldn't fit in the car. You had to and call we were your like, dad. Yeah, but we looked like idiots standing out in the parking lot trying to shove it in our tiny little car. Maybe, would I don't know, maybe we could have folded the seats down. Did we no, not know how to do that? No, I think we tried everything. Did we? Yeah, hmm. it just wasn't going to fit. Love and Life said, love watching you. I learned so much. I'd like to know if there's a rule of thumb to know what plants you can cut back and how far, all the way to the ground, a third, etc. And can this be done at any time of the year, even when it's 90s outside? Thank you for all you do. Um, you know, we do our cutback and deadheading and all that stuff all throughout the summer as plants need it. And I think the way that you learn, there's no like really good rule of thumb. Unfortunately, it's kind of just taking that one variety of plant doing, you know, asking somebody at the local garden center. Oftentimes it'll show on the plant tag or say something about shear back. I like that about proven winners tags. There's always maintenance notes at the very end and it'll say like shear back by a third, you know, or shear back to the leaf canopy for a second flush of blooms. So it'll give you some instructions there. Not all tags have it, but it does take a little bit of research on your part to kind of know. So anyway, I hope that I mean, we don't really have like a comprehensive video about that because our videos are structured so much based on what we're actually doing out in the garden. And I always kind of wonder like we, how we would put together a video like that, you yeah. know, because things need to be done at such different times and, but it would be nice to be. Like, it's like, how would it, how could you organize the information to where it could be easily accessible for someone who is searching it? Yeah. You know, how could they find what they want quickly without mm -hmm. watching a, you know, 40 minute video right. of all the different plants. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. Or you can make a bunch of little short ones. Yeah. Uh, Becca said, what liquid fertilizer do you use for annuals? We use the Proven Winters Water Soluble Fertilizer. So it's a little uh, powder that you mix in water, um, and that's what we use on a weekly basis. We have tried other things, but we always switch back to that one because it's got EDDHA chelated iron in it, which for our high pH 
water situation and soil situation, it really helps keep our plants nice and green. Sarah said, when you notice a plant struggling with chlorosis, how long does it take for the foliage to turn green again? It's kind of your department, Erin. Um, you might see it as quickly as like a week, mm -hmm. seven days. Um, it may take longer than that. You may like what I would probably do is I would probably uh, continue to give it uh, chelated iron every week or so, maybe every two weeks until you see that it's green. Because you can't really overdo with that, same right? season. Just, like you should see an improvement in the same season. Sure. That's the whole point with chelated iron is it's like immediately available to the, uh -huh. to the plant. So if it's not greening up, I would keep doing the chelated iron. And if if it's really not working, like if it's a tree, you may need to do like the drill hole thing and and actually like inject it. Which we've never done before. We've never tried that before, but I've I know that arborists Lots of do it. Do it. Mm -hmm. Michelle said, "Can you use that iron on food crops?" I think so. There's yeah, well, vegetables on the label, right? Yeah. It's not a synthetic or anything, no. right? No, but it's been, it is, it is kind synthetic. of a synthetic in that it's been formulated to be a type of iron, like restructured. Mm -hmm. It's not like synthetic ingredients have been added to it, but it's like that ingredient has been altered to where it can be taken it's up by chelated. the plant. Right. I don't really know what that means exactly. Either. <laughs> Or such a wealth of information. I've had it explained to me, um, the because I asked Espoma why they don't sell it, uh -huh. and he's like, "Well, we are Espoma organic, and yeah. <laughs> it's it's a little tough to. Well, there's nothing wrong with you know using chelated iron. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to harm yourself or others. Mm -hmm. It's a little tough for them to to sell a, a synthetic product. Sure. Uh, Katie said, I don't think I've ever heard you talk about frogs being on your property. That was a fun surprise to see. I didn't even see it when I was out there. I only saw it when I watched the video back. Yeah. I did a double take. I'm like, Aaron, there's a frog yeah. <laughs> jumping through. I have a question about the wisteria and maple tree. If the maple survives, will you need to remove the wisteria or are you planning on having to keep uh, pruning it back all the time? Oh, geez. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do there. That wisteria um, doesn't bloom consistently. It grows like crazy. Um, unless it decided to up and bloom amazing in the next, se you know, like next season maybe, um, I probably will think about taking it out because I don't want it to be a constant battle with the maple tree. And I don't know about that maple tree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We've talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next video is Hartley update slash garden plans and organizing the flower shed. So I started in the Hartley. I wanted to show you the um, countertop and the sink, which are now fully plumbed. The heating unit is in there. It's all set up and good to go. Um, I also wanted to show you our rough sketch for the gardens that are going around the Hartley since it's taking for us forever to get to it. I just wanted to give you something to show you that we do have something planned and kind of share our vision for that space. And then we ended up in the cut flower shed where I just did some organizing. I had a bunch of crates with uh, vases. It's kind of like what I'm thinking about these days because it's so hot outside. I don't really want to be out working. Nobody really should have to be all day when it's 109 degrees outside. Um, like Paul is done by what, three? Yeah. Yeah, she comes in early and um, they have a lot of things like he and Bethany have things that they're doing in the, actually in the root cellar. They have a project going on in there. It's 45 degrees in there. Yeah. Um, and like a lot of inside things, we've kind of saved a list for, you know, the hot times so that nobody has to be out there except for to hopefully just Well, water. And it's not the worst when you're watering things, if that's kind of your only job, because, uh -huh. you know, the water coming out of the hose is pretty cool. Well, so you're you can... standing. It's still hot and you're sweating, but it's not like physical. Like you're not hauling bags. And... Well, and you can... You can wet yourself down if you need to. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're gonna. We all overheat. acclimate pretty pretty much. Like I can still work out there and be totally fine. It's not something I want want to do when mm -hmm. it's you know over a hundred degrees. It's not something I want to do when it's over ninety. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a, I want to be a fair weather gardener a little bit when it's. It it's warmer. times like these that we ask ourselves, now why do we live here again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, did I even, oh, I didn't even answer the questions. Okay, or start the questions. First one, Lala Palooza said, Rome wasn't built in the day. You've accomplished so much in the past year. Be proud and thanks for taking us along for the ride. Thank you for that because it's something that we have to remind ourselves. Like we have, we have done a lot this year. Um, and I think sometimes it's, I don't know, like I'll see a comment of somebody being like, I really want to see the planting around the Hartley. I'm like, well, that you want to know something? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to see it too, but I'm at the mercy of everything that's going on here. And I'm not going to push and, you know, uh, try not to be like irritated about mm. some of the things that go on. 
um, try to keep positivity. There's a lot of fun things and beautiful things that are happening apart from not being able to plant around the Hartley yet. So we try to focus on those things and I think that's, that's good. But it's also good to see that, I mean, to hear that encouragement, that it does take time. It takes a while and our whole garden, you know, being so young, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we get a little bit uh, anxious for things to be bigger and to see that end vision because you can't really see it until the trees are big. Yeah. You know, unless you're, I mean, if you're really visual. What was really inspiring, Ken was out for a week and I was editing some videos and you did the 15 perennial video mm. uh, or 10 perennials that do that, well in the oh, heat. Yes, yes. And I looked back at the footage of when you planted the Tuscan Sun Heliopsis. Yeah, yeah. And it was so just barren oh. out there when you planted that, and how nice it looks now Thank with the grass pathway. Thank you all for sticking with us. Like yeah. the non, all the non-pretty gardening videos we've done. Yeah. So many. Yeah. They just look horrible, and I'm like trying to impart. This is gonna. This, this is, gonna, is gonna, be gonna be awesome. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> One day. But it's where everybody starts with a new space. Mm-hmm. You know, it yeah. doesn't, doesn't look good at first. Right. You were the one who brought that to my attention too. You're like, do you remember what it looked like? Yeah. When you planted those, come look at this. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, Sarah said, why not just a hanging curtain on the back wall of the flower shed, I'm guessing. Because I talked about the raw wood. We've got the tongue and groove in there that we left raw um, just to live with it for a little while. You know, we had the outside painted white. I was going to have the whole entire thing painted white. And we decided just to hold off a little bit because I do like it to look a little bit more on the rustic natural side because it is a flower shed and I don't want it to necessarily look like an interior space. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to take it that direction. So I thought, well, let's just hold off for a minute, let it be raw wood, but it's incredibly hard to take pictures and video with an orange background. And I hate to even like let that be a consideration, but it's, mm -hmm. it is, it's huge. You know, lighting is huge in, in uh, what we do. And so it would be nice if it was a little bit more subdued. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of you guys suggested like a white wash, like not completely covering the, the detail of the wood, letting some of that shine through, but lightening it a little bit. And that might be a good place to start before covering over with paint. Um, but I ran across, and I can't remember, I ran across an Instagram account that showed their potting bench wall that was like, it's, it's a color, you guys should look it up. It's a Sherwin-Williams color called Evergreen Fog. It's a really soft green color. And I was like, oh, that's pretty because they had like tools hanging on the mm -hmm. wall and so I could see it. I'm like, that's, that's a potting shed, you know, that's perfect. So I might take it that direction. I'm not really sure. We'll see. Uh, God Loves You said, where do you get the hutches? I ordered those from Wayfair. I like them. Angie said, do you feel like your setup in the Hartley would support year round production? Had you decided to use it for that? I'm very close to pulling the trigger on the size down from yours, but wanted to see how toler tolerable yours was in the summer heat. It would be intolerable if we didn't have an AC unit in there. In our uh, climate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there, if you have an area, like they say, greenhouses need to have like all the sun, you know, they need mm -hmm. the sun for plants to grow, which is true. But in our area, like we planted that maple tree nearby to hopefully provide some shade. We're planting another tree on the west side because if it shades in the afternoon, great. As long as the stuff in there gets a little block of morning sun, mm -hmm. that's a little less intense. I think things will be fine. But our heat is so intense that we wouldn't even be able to step inside there if we didn't have that AC unit taking the edge off of it. Well, it's 110 outside. Yeah. And it's not going to be any cooler than that inside. It'll be way so, worse than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can open up all the doors and windows and... Still be worse than that. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. But it's not going to... So intolerable yeah. <laughs> in our climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it just completely depends on your climate, whether or not you get rain, cloud cover. I wonder sort of though, um, if you should site in an area like ours, if you really should site it under some deciduous trees mm -hmm. so that you get the shade from the leaves in the summertime, but in the wintertime is really the only time that you're using sure. it anyway mm -hmm. at, for production. Yeah. And then, because uh, the sun is going through the branches because they're deciduous. Right. right. So it feels like we can kind of go to town with just planting trees around it. Mm -hmm. And I think we should. Yeah. So that maybe it is a little bit more usable in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But I think that's another reason you haven't really been like gung ho about like getting the inside the greenhouse done. I mm -hmm. think you'll work on that when it's appropriate, which is like fall through early, yeah. early spring. Yeah. When there, we just have a lot of other things that we're focusing on. So, you know, we just work on things as we work on them, you know, that space will come. Yeah. Uh, Sherilyn said, love the drawing plan for your new garden by the Hartley. May I suggest a wider step down width, 10 to 12 feet. Main wide walkways can offer restful viewing space as well as an expanded view of the Hartley upon approach. 
you can always neck it down with a potted topiary, which is very true. Um, we just discussed several different widths right there with the placement of that maple tree. I think if we get any wider, we won't be able to complete any kind of box of formation around it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we went in a little bit because you know we're gonna come straight across to a pillar then the walk, the step down, and then another pillar, and then boxwoods are gonna take off from there, and then they're gonna do a curve around the base of that maple tree. Uh, and I think it would just make it way too close to that. It's possible that tree may not survive and may have to come out, in which case we can kind of adjust mm -hmm. from there. I'm a little bit like tentative about putting in our patio and all of that. Like I feel like we should leave that space where they drove in to install the tree mm -hmm. so they could drive right back in and pop it out yeah and put a new one in, yeah, in there right. i mean i kind of almost felt like that from the beginning when half of it was gone yeah when they installed it you know the big branches on that one side and we'll see what happens i mean the leaves are still they're not cr i mean they're they're stressed mm -hmm. but they're not crunching up or anything like right. that the tree is still alive yeah at this point it's an interesting experience this whole the whole thing yeah, really? I, we learned that you should, because of the machine, at least the, the machine that this guy uses, you really should get a tree that has really tall branches mm -hmm. um, and maybe not as old, not as established of a root system. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe look for like a 10 year old tree as opposed to a 15 year old tree. Mm -hmm. but, but definitely install trees that are limbed up. Yeah. I think they'll travel better. Mm -hmm. That was the other thing is, you know, how far they have to travel to get to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of like did a number on the tree having yeah. to go 45 minutes. So it might be completely fine. Like next spring, it might mm -hmm. leaf out. But one of the other main branches on that same side that the other two broke off, one of them split. Aaron mm -hmm. had to bolt it and it looks like that one's dead. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge part of the tree. Yeah. Anyway. I hope I'm not coming across, across yeah. too like bummed out about everything because there's so many good things going on. And well, the fact that we were able, e able to even try that as yeah. an option is pretty like amazing in and of yeah. itself. But all that said, I feel like going to town on a patio and then having to have a tree removed that's mm -hmm. that big, it like keeping the order of things to where like it's not going to hurt us to wait till next spring because we have a ton of work to do around the Hartley. That way we can get the the approach proper and maybe if we got you know had to take that one out we could make it a little bit wider mm -hmm. and it would be easier to work around and th that sort of thing yeah yeah i think it, in the end it's better to go a little slower anyway i know that you you probably hate to hear those words but we do make better decisions yeah because there's so many things that we eliminate after we have a chance to think about it for right. a while um patricia said well you have to shut off the water to the sink in the winter <laughs> i think i just addressed that um I love the sink, how nice uh, that will be when you entertain a work. Yes, so uh, in the end, I will not have to shut off the water. It'll be working water year round. And in fact, you guys, this, so this is the kind of thing I love. When somebody comes to, the, to install the heater and the filtration system and they put the faucet in, they went ahead and put another line in to the left, no, to the right of all of the contraption underneath the sink, underneath the cupboard, but with an, an ordinary faucet. Mm -hmm. So it's all connected and I can still put a hose in there because they were like, you know, the sink is nice for you know entertaining and doing like little potted things, but it's likely you're gonna wanna hook up a hose and like drag it across this floor and water other things in the Hartley. So true. Yeah. Like I wouldn't have thought of that. And yeah. they did. That's what I love. I love when a professional comes in and they think through things like yeah. what can make your life easier. Here are some different options. And I'm like, yes. Well that's what you expect because they do it for a living. Yeah. They know what people how people use it mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. I think my biggest problem, like I know what I want out of a design or I know what I want out of a space. I have no idea how to source what I want. Right. In fact, we just had a designer. I don't know what's the name of the designer. He reached out and with oh, some. Um, J Jacob and Co. Yeah. Something. Beautiful. He sent over some pictures of some of his work and beautiful. Uh, uh, Interior design. Yeah. Gorgeous. And he had some faucet options um, and some other things because like I'm just ordering from places I know of. I don't know where to source all of these gorgeous things that I see in other people's, yeah. that they're probably working with somebody who knows where to source the right stuff. Yeah. And so like, I was like, real excited to learn about him and maybe we can do something yeah. with him in the future because I need help knowing how to find those things because I just, I'm so new to it. Uh, Jacqueline said, it's going to be so peaceful and perfect. What program did you use to draw in your plans? That was uh, just the photo app. Markup. On, yeah, on uh, iPad. Yeah. 
just hit edit and then mark up and then just draw your stuff. It was very rough, but you it's can get basically this. the equivalent of like paint in yeah. on a, a PC. Yeah. Something freeing about that though. Yeah, it's like so simple that yeah. a child could do it. Very simple. Cindy said, have you ever thought of using your garden space for weddings? It has come up. We've talked about it. I would love to. Uh, um, not open necessarily to the public, but if you could handpick someone you liked, you know, <laughs> and I think that would be really fun. I think it's maybe not somebody you liked, but somebody you trust. Yeah. Trusted, which it probably is somebody you like, yeah. I'm guessing. But somebody you trust with your space. Right. It's a little weird because we live here. So to have it be like a venue for anybody other than somebody that was close to you would be mm. a little bit diff like difficult and a little weird. Yeah. I don't know that I would like that very much. but I think it would be fun, though. One thing that um, I've worried about, though, is that you'd have to have a, an early cutoff because we have neighbors nearby. So you couldn't have music. Music. You could do music, but you really want to cut it off by like nine, mm -hmm. ten at the latest. Yeah. Because um, you don't want to be like that neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, even though I'm kind of like, we were here first. <laughs> Aaron, <laughs> the truth comes out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we can already hear the fairgrounds. They do concerts and stuff on some nights. Yeah. And we can hear it like plain as day. Oh, yeah. It like travels up the hill. It does. Yeah. I'll like call my mom and hold the phone out. I'm like... You hear it? Yeah. <laughs> We've got a, some kind of whatever concert going on right now. And then you can hear the announcements at the county fair, which will be next week. Uh -huh. We'll hear all of those. Like the watermelon spinning yeah. competition? Yeah, that, that was the funniest. That first summer we lived here and I was outside working in the garden and I heard watermelon seed spinning contest will start in the loafing shed in 15 minutes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, how funny. Yeah. Like it's such a quaint thing. Yeah. Um, and then we have our high school, the high school I went to, pretty close by, like just a few blocks uh, over. And so we hear football games mm -hmm. and things like that. But it's happy sounds. I don't mind it. And it's not all the time. Yeah. So I don't know how. Oh, wedding venue. <laughs> I think, how do we get on that? Yeah. And that is it, you guys, for this week's recap video. I hope you're all having a great week. Stay cool. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.